You're listening to Claire Blake on Brisbane's 4BC. Brought to you by Caruso's Natural Health. Now, it's been a few years now, especially in the early years of random breath testing. People were full of theories, weren't they, about what would foil the breath test, garlic, potatoes. I remember hearing about peanut butter, all sorts of things. But now we are hearing about the things that can possibly have the opposite effect. Toothpaste, chewing gum and perfume may be affecting the roadside breath test. Andrew Wiseman is Principal Solicitor at Wiseman Lawyers and he's on the phone. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us. Afternoon, Clay. Now, there are other things too that may affect the roadside test like mouthwash and menthol cigarettes. What sort of an impact do they really have? Well, zero is the short answer. Um, look, the bottom line is uh, uh, there's certain technologies now that have been introduced for the sake of uh, RBT sites up. Um, the uh, initial technology uh, being used by certain police is uh, the vehicle pulls up, the device is put in the cab. If it detects alcohol, further testing is conducted. If it doesn't, the motorists moved on. And by doing that, that saves the police time and also it's uh, better for the environment because it cuts down on the uh, plastic tubes that are used. Um, it's only once the uh, device detects some form of alcohol that the actual uh, traditional RBT test is undergone. So if, if the device starts beeping, all right, now blown to this tube. Mm. Uh, if, if that's clear, motorists are sent on. And it's only after that second test that uh, a person is taken away for the only real uh, test that counts, and that's the one in the booze bus or at the station. So uh, there's been a little bit of sort of uh, scaremongering going on, but the, the short uh, version is uh, no change. All that is doing is speeding things up, and uh, okay. if you are under the limit, you won't be uh, before a magistrate. What sort of things, though, that may start at beeping before you do the blow into the tube? They are those things that we mentioned? Well, yeah, hand sanitizer. Uh, you know, if you've gone a bit uh, overboard with your Chanel number no. 5 and that kind of stuff. Uh, my understanding is it'll detect anything that's uh, got alcohol in it. Uh, but again, um, the fact that the thing beeps doesn't mean you're going to go to court. It's simply a, a, a preliminary uh, detector. Uh, and even beyond that, the next one where you're blown to the tube, even though a number of displays on the uh, device itself, all it's really tell telling the police officer is... Uh, is it yes or no, and it's only if it's yes, then a proper, uh, more scrutinised reading's produced. Okay. Uh, like, when you go to court, or when people go to court, it's never the roadside test that's no. needed. It's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, of any use or legal basis for a, uh, for a drink driving charge. It's only that booze bus or station yeah. test, which in this circumstance would be the third along the line. Okay, so the roadside test is highly sensitive, but it doesn't have the right... Um, equipment and I understand what you mean now because I was thinking oh no so these poor people uh, have that first test and then they have to leave their car there and get taken down to the police station for the second test which would be very embarrassing and humiliating if you hadn't had a drink but you just overdosed a bit on the perfume well exactly yeah you've gone a bit uh, overboard with your Jean-Paul Gaultier and next thing you're going to court now that's that's not the case at all and a lot of the earlier uh, news reports were sort of trying to fuel that perception but no it, all it's doing is making it easier for the motorists to get in and out a lot quicker, easier for the police, and uh, as I said, cutting down on plastics being wasted by putting a tube in every single motorist's uh, mouth that goes through that RBT. Absolutely a beat up. Yeah, well, in a nutshell. <laughs> it, it is, and I know that you often uh, work for people who are in these problems, and it is demeaning and humiliating, and it's meant to have that effect, I guess, because... Uh, it's meant to be a deterrent, but how often do you defend people who come back for a second round? Well, it's probably no more than 20%, which obviously isn't good for business, but uh, I guess it's an indicator of the, the true person that gets himself in this situation. There's a perception that uh, people who get done for uh, drink driving are, are hoons or menaces on the road, but if, if people could pull the uh, veil of society back and see exactly who it is that... Uh, persons like myself represent mm. they're people who make a mistake once uh, by the time the magistrate and I have lectured them on the steps of court uh, they've learnt their lesson and you never see them again so it's probably about a 20% uh, recidivism rate but again we're talking to someone who uh, like a couple of years ago the Bly government changed the laws uh, up until the Bly government 
if someone who had an open licence got done for drink driving, they'd serve their time and go back to their full licence. Uh, Bly brought in a law where uh, they changed that, regardless of how old you are, when you get your licence back, you get zero blood alcohol per year, but the thing is they never bothered telling anyone. So there was a spate of people getting done 0.001 when they were supposed to be zero, but they didn't know that. Like, when they went to court, they were told, uh, yeah, you can drive again on X date. Uh, when they went to Queensland Transport, they were told that yeah, the Labor government from uh, two terms ago slid this law in and it caught a lot of people out. Uh, so there's an example of repeat offenders who aren't the traditional hoon that uh, certain parts of the media like to portray. I did not know about that. Uh, that Well, you know, when you were saying before, you know, they're not the sort of people that you think you are, I was thinking... Well, really, that's not a mistake that you should make. We all know how it works, and it's really indefensible. But when you explain it like that, if why weren't they being told? Was it revenue raising? Were they? Oh uh, well, look, I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but uh, yeah, look, who knows? But uh, well, what I can say is, after this, there was a bit of an outcry about it. It wasn't overly. Uh, covered in the news, but obviously magistrates were getting frustrated, defendants were getting frustrated, even police were getting frustrated about time and time again, you know, uh, 59-year-old uh, Sharon from uh, Chapel Hill was coming before court and no-one told her she was zero. Mm. And then after about six months of perhaps, I'm just speculating, but there might have been uh, you know, agitation within the judicial system, uh, little business-sized uh, Business car sized ads started appearing in the Courier Mail. Oh, you yeah, by the way, everyone, uh, if this happened, you know what I mean? So yeah. they did, after the event, uh, put some ads in the paper. But yeah, look, I can only speculate. But um, yeah, so but what I'm getting at is that's an example of how, uh, you know, good hard working Queenslanders can find themselves in the situation more than once. And uh, believe me, we're not talking about, uh, you know, Les Patterson's uh, behind the wheel with beetroot stains on their shirt. We're talking good, respectable, hard-working people who uh, made a mistake and then, for whatever reason, uh, were... I won't say entrapped, but I think you know what I'm getting at, into making the mistake again. But uh, I suppose, in a nutshell, though, we're not talking about uh, alcoholics who don't care about anyone, about anyone but themselves. We're yeah. talking good people who have made a mistake. Uh, but, but that said... The amount of people that I represent who have made the mistake more than twice, it's probably no more than 10%. Okay. We did look at some stats recently, and uh, we were surprised at the ages of people who were caught drink driving, and they weren't just the young people that we're assuming. No. Look, I have uh, first-time offenders. You know, uh, I acted for a lady last week. She was, uh, I think she was mid-50s, a school teacher. She had, like, three points in her entire history, Uh, you know, uh, partner passed away. Uh, she was going through a grieving period. Got together with friends to try and uh, move on with life, and you know, uh, ring wines without counting. And bang, here she is having to ring Wiseman. Uh, it's, it's the breathalyzer does not discriminate. And yeah, as I said, if you can pull back that veil of society and see the the true demographic that uh, engages myself, I think most Queenslanders would be surprised. Yeah, I think there'd certainly be people that disagree with you, but um, certainly you're in the pointy end dealing with them all the time. And I love talking to you because I just love your Les Patterson references and you've <laughs> waiting for you to oh. trot out another perfume. You're pretty good with the brands. Yeah, hi, oh, yeah. Look, I'm full of real world analogies. Uh, how, how much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're perfect in line because we've got our other real world guy, the uh, Ocker Doctor, Matt Young, coming up soon. Great to talk to you, Andrew, and thanks for... Um, bashing down that beat up for us. Anytime, take care. Andrew Wiseman, he's a principal solicitor at Wiseman Lawyers and